नमो तस भगवत हर हाथो समुदस नमो तस भगवत हर हाथो समुदस नमो तस भगवत आर हाथो समुदस बुद्धंग दमंग संगंग नमस्मी So today is the post of the day. We have all taken our precepts, and um, uh, I appreciate having this opportunity to share some dhamma reflection. So Buddha took a handful of leaves and uh, asked, what is more, the leaves in my hand or the leaves in the forest? And he further commented saying that what I know is, the, is compared to the leaves in the forest and what I teach is compared to the leaves in the hand. So that's all the Tathagatas or the Buddhas who come into this world. What they preach is the Four Noble Truths. And that's all we need to overcome this birth and death we all experience in this long sansaric journey. Because we are all brothers and sisters in old age, sickness and death. So if one is born to live 80 years, so we grow after one year, we are 79 years away from death. And after 10 years, we are 70 years away from death. And after 79, we are one year away from death. So we all travel to this scale of time getting close to death and that's what we call living and uh, life is full of ups and downs so we experience these unsatisfactoriness and stresses in life so to overcome that we seek happiness partying, eating, drinking, clubbing. That's how we forget that we get old, get sick and die. So that's why the Four Noble Truths is all what we need to overcome this birth and death we all undergo. What happens is when we, whether we have power or money, nobody can escape old age, sickness and death. 
So when these calamities happen in life, what happens is we take it personally. We don't see it as common to all beings who are born. So the more we personalize it, the more we become depressed. But if we can see it as common to all beings, the mind becomes equanimous. The cooling down happens and we can get close to Nibbana. Having, having the capacity to see it in this way. So, but there are there are four kinds of happiness. That's that's true happiness, seeing the four noble truths and understanding the four noble truths, overcoming this old age, sickness and death, birth and death. But there are four kinds of happiness Buddha was talking about. It's uh, being contented. Contented with what we have. If you're constantly looking for something we don't have, we never appreciate what we have. Because the mind is constantly looking for something we don't have, then the contentment doesn't arise because what we have is not appreciated. So that's the kind of happiness coming out of contentment. And the second happiness is enjoying what we have, enjoying the wealth, because Buddha was so pragmatic. There were, there was, these were instructions given to people. It, it's not, uh, even as lay people, we can live in a skillful way, enjoying the wealth we have, not hoarding, not being stingy. It's using the wealth in four different ways. That is, two parts of the wealth being invested in business. That is, then it yields more income. That is, one can improve one's quality of life by investing two parts in the business. And one part we use for personal use and another part leaving for a rainy day having a pension. So even the part we use, Buddha was asking that some of it to be given to charity. So this, this, in this way we can enjoy the wealth we have living, using the wealth in a good way. And the third kind of happiness is not having debt because having debt is heavy. When we have a debt, until it's paid off, we feel it, feel we carry it, we feel it heavy, but when there's no debt, there's lightness. So that's the fourth, third kind of happiness that is not having debt. <clears throat> and the fourth kind of happiness is uh, <coughs> Happiness coming of coming out of blamelessness, living in a way, conducting oneself. We can have right livelihood, then of course one is quite nobody can blame oneself having a right livelihood and blamelessness coming out of through bodily, through body, speech and mind, any actions done through body, speech and mind, if they don't create bad karma, that's the happiness coming out of blamelessness because we have lived the life in a skillful way so that's the kind, the fourth kind of happiness.
So taking another, Sutta Buddha has explained the uh, ignorance sutta, what Buddha meant by ignorance. So in this ignorance is, for in normal day-to-day -day, uh, life, ignorance is not knowing how to do things. But in Buddha's sense, ignorance is not knowing the Four Noble Truths, because as he pointed out, all we need is this handful of leaves, which is knowing the Four Noble Truths to overcome this birth and death cycle we are all part of. So ignorance is not knowing the Four Noble Truths. And he went further to say, ignorance has its nutriment. And the nutriment for ignorance is uh, five hindrances. Having five hindrances lead to ignorance. So the five hindrances being uh, sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and doubt. So sensual desire Sensual desire is not, uh, it's not the beauty in things, you know. There's beauty, in, there's beauty and joy in life, there's, you know. But that's not what sensual desire in these five hindrances. It's greed for the thought. If we take an object, if there's an object or a sound or a form, which is pleasant and we give a uh, nice sign of beauty. There's beauty in this form or the sound. But if we give unwise attention to this sign of beauty, that is, we take these, the sign of beauty, the features, and we, we give unwise reflection to this sign of beauty and we don't see that the true nature of this sign of beauty, because we think it will give us pleasure, it will give us long-lasting happiness, and try to make it me and mine. That's what sensual desire is thinking about this, and trying to, hoping that this will give us, give long-lasting happiness, this beauty that, which is, one is attached to, or yeah, one is uh, wanting to make it me and mine. That That's the kind of hindrance Buddha was talking about. Because it's like a boneless, uh, meatless bone, a uh, bone without meat, a dog licking a bone without meat. The hunger is never satisfied, the dog will be licking this bone because of the smell of blood or it may be a blood smeared bone. So just for the taste of blood, the dog is licking this bone but the dog's hunger is not satisfied by licking this bone. So the sensual desire is like that. It's, we are thinking about this sign of beauty and wanting it to be giving us long lasting pleasure. Then usually these hindrances are connected to one another. So when we chase sensual desire and when we can't get what we want, what arises in the mind is ill will. Usually sensual desire is followed by ill will. And when the mind is full of ill will, it can lead to sloth and torpor, it's the mind is paralyzed. 
It's the mind and the mind contents get paralyzed. We prison ourselves into mental paralysis. It's like having a favorite vase and when it's broken, we get very angry and out of anger, we don't know what to do after that. It's like a mental paralysis. And then the fourth hindrance being restlessness, having like a state of wondering what to do, having too many choices and being distracted with all these choices. And then also restlessness and worry is the other one, the hindrance that is worry about misgivings that one has done or worry about the good that one couldn't do. So that's the remorse one has. And then doubt. So these mental hindrances arise in the mind, which lead to ignorance. Because according to Buddha's teachings, the mind is luminous. These adventitious defilements enter the mind and mind lose its luminosity. So five hindrances has, has its uh, nutriment as well. Because in Buddha's teachings, most of the, it's all about cause and effect. If this exists, this, if this exists, then there is this. So the nutriment for five hindrances is three misconducts through body, speech and mind. Well, that's why we have the precepts to remind us about these misconducts. So the first three misconducts that can happen through body is killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. So that's why the precepts we take are so important. You took the precepts tonight, and when we, we are about to do something, we can remember the precept, and that prevents us from committing this act. So those are the three bodily misconducts and the verbal misconducts, speech, lying, uh, but tail bearing, harsh speech and uh, frivolous talk, gossiping because speech can be, a lot of damage can be done through speech. Sometimes we use speech, speech as a weapon and it has a lot of power, the words that come out of our mouths. So these are the three misconducts, four, four uh, misconducts that can happen through speech. And there are three mental misconducts. When I first heard this, I mean, uh, when I was studying Buddhism, when I was young, I couldn't pay much attention to these three. I really didn't understand because uh, I wasn't very uh, ready to understand the mind. But as I have started the monastic life, I'm beginning to understand how important these uh, three mental misconducts are.
those are the three roots for greed, hatred and delusion. Really, it's born out of greed, hatred and delusion. And the three mental misconducts are covetousness, ill will and uh, correcting one's view. So covetousness, it's born out of greed, but it's so subtle whenever we see something, the, the first thought that comes to our mind is, I wish I have it. We try to own it. If something somebody else has, wanting this thing that somebody else has, that's covetousness. And ill will is frustration or anger that arise in the mind because things are not going our own way. And the uh, correcting one's view, I think that's born out of delusion. So covetousness is born out of greed and ill will is born out of hatred. And it's very difficult to uh, understand delusion because according to Buddhist teachings, we are all deluded. We are constantly deluded. Only an arahant is free of delusion. So all the wrong views and opinions and creating people, all this is born out of delusion. Because it's like these greed, hatred and delusion are like three belts, a vehicle running with three belts. So the, the delusion belt is running all the time. It's constantly running. When there's greed, they can't have hatred. When there's hatred, you can't have greed. But the delusion belt is constantly running. So all the views and opinions are born out of this delusion. It's very subtle. how we create views and opinions. And with these creation of views and opinions, we create people. And it's, we label people, we erase their goodness. So it can lead to many, many defilements entering the mind, having not, not straightening one's views and opinions. So that's the mental misconduct, which we have to be aware of all the time. I mean, that's what the work we have to do here, to be aware of what arises in the mind. And there's a, so this is the three mental, uh, three conducts, misconducts through body, speech and mind which leads to hindrances. And these three misconducts has its nutriment. And the nutriment for three misconducts is six senses, unrestrained senses. <coughs> we have these six senses, the five external ones, the eye, ear, nose, tongue and body. And we are constantly taking sense impressions from these five external sense bases.
We don't have to ask the eye to look or the ear to listen. It does it automatically. So we are constantly taking these sense impressions. So how, what, what did Buddha mean by sense restraint? So if we close the eyes, have we restrained the eye? So a blind person has restrained their eye faculty? The restraint Buddha was talking about is if we see something on the road which is not attractive, we avoid it. We we avoid it and walk. But if we see something beautiful, we look at it again and again. We are happy to turn around and look back at it or and we bring this in and sense impression back home or to the monastery, you know. So we the restraint Buddha was talking about is seeing objects, hearing sounds, smelling, odors, tasting, having tactile sensations. But seeing it as, with restraint, seeing it for what it is, that it won't give us long-lasting happiness. It's not going to give pleasure and it can't own it. So that's the restraint. We do hear, we do hear, we see, we taste. And but we enjoy it, but see it for what it is. That's the restraint Buddha was talking about. And to have this kind of restraint, one has to have mindfulness, the awareness, clear comprehension, wise reflection. So all that helps to have the sense restraint Buddha was talking about. So we have to hear the Dhamma. And once we have heard the Dhamma, remembering it. It's like we go to the doctor and the doctor says uh, to avoid red meat or be a diabetic to not to take sugar. So when, as soon as we see a sweet item or red meat, we remember the doctor's advice. In the same way, we remember the Buddha's teachings. So when we see thing, these things arise in the mind, we see how the mind is, that's the sixth sense, taking all these sense impressions from the other five sense doors, and mind is the repository, how the mind is working with it, receiving all these sense impressions and mind having his ideation to remember the mind doctor. So the mind doctor is the Lord Buddha. The Lord Buddha has to come to this world to teach us these teachings. And that's what we need to remember. When things arise in the mind, how to skillfully navigate it.
And then the faith arises when we see that these things do work. We can experience it ourselves, putting these teachings into practice and see how the mind development can happen. And then the faith arises. So for the faith to arise, we have to listen to the Dhamma, we have to hear the Dhamma, and to hear the Dhamma, we have to have uh, right association, the teachers, associate, associating the right kind of, having right kind of company, helps to us to hear the Dhamma and then arise faith and we can put this Dhamma we have heard into practice. So in a way we are very privileged to have these teachings, to be born into a human existence with all our faculties intact and the teachings are available. So we are in a very fortunate predicament. All we have to do is realize it, to know what we are sitting on. It's like sometimes it's said that we are sitting on a pile of gold, but don't we, re we don't realize it. So I feel that we are very fortunate to have these teachings after 2,600 years after the Buddha's Parinibbana and we have the support of the lay people who look after our needs and there are fascinating buildings coming up so we have the four requisites in abundance and we have all the support from the community and from the lay people. So we have to count our blessings. So all we need is the Four Noble Truths, which Lampo Sumedho keeps talking about. That's all the handful of leaves. So I like to share these reflections with you tonight. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>